Hello, uh, I'm Paul Beckwith. The uh, next El Nino is probably going to blow through all of the global temperature records. We'll probably exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial, where pre-industrial is usually defined as about the 1880 to 1910 temperature average. At least that's how it's defined nowadays, remembering the baseline shift of about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees to the year um, 1750, which was the original pre-industrial baseline. But that aside, um, I'm going to, this quick video is just going to talk briefly about the risks, the great risks and the likelihood that we get a powerful El Nino, you know, that exceeds even that of 1998 and the 2015-2016 powerful El Nino, which you know, the 2016 one uh, pushed up uh, global temperatures to all-time highs. So I'm going to talk all about that, but first I want to just show you, you know, I showed you my messy office yesterday, so it's actually less messy, but still very messy. And my poor plants, uh, I'm resurrecting them, and uh, most of them I think will survive. Uh, so just to you know, the risk of, uh, well, if, if I, I'm trying to make you guys feel good because I'm sure most offices are much um, nicer, you know, they're in much, in much neater state than mine. Uh, so that's the main desk with my computer and my wine glass there. I resurrected this plant over here and the cactus. My cactuses are doing great. So managed to push a bookshelf over here and Still got lots of work and the reason why this was done is because all of the uh windows in this room except for except for one i replaced that one in the center a couple of years ago myself um and uh we had people come and do it the other ones just uh in late december so you know it's a real it's still a real mess but you probably notice uh, differences from yesterday. I mean, it's coming. So each time I do these videos, I'll show you a quick glimpse of my <laughs> of my office just for fun. Anyway, let's get uh, into the uh, details. Let's let you know what is happening with these uh, with the so-called ENSO phenomena. So this is the El Nino phase. Um, so basically, what happens is you get um, a relaxation of this walker circulation, which, um, uh, so you have this, this walker circul circulation occurring. Um, so basically, the uh, you get a lot of convection over here along near the equator in the Western uh, Pacific. Um, in the normal case, well, let's go to the normal case. So the normal case, you have this walker circulation coming this way. Okay, and you get strong trade winds and you get uh, heating of air and convection, rising air, lots of rainfall over in this region near Indonesia. And the circulation pattern is like this. So the water, the warm water in, is pushed over to the west. Okay, now, so the, the air is rising here, it sinks here, this whole thing here is the walker circulation, the equator's here. Um, so if you look under the water, you have the warm water down to depth, 200 meters here. You get the thermocline shallowing as you go to the east. So this is a normal situation. What we've had for the last three years is the La Nina. This is the neutral end. So we've had the La Nina, um, where the walker circulation actually increases. So you get more of this water pushed. The, uh, so, so the thermocline, you know, the red, the hotter water is pushed more to the west than normal. So you get cold water near the equator off South America. Okay, so that's what we've had three years in a row is very, very unusual. But now <coughs> what we're doing is we're heading to the um, El Nino phase. And you'll notice this circulation gets very, very weak and in fact switches direction here. So now you get a strong count counter current here in the ocean surface, uh, which pushes the warm water over. So compare the neutral phase 
the, and, and this water is all pushed. So the thermocline flattens out and it actually decreases as you go eastward, you get the warm water here. So this warm water brackets the equator and comes to South America. That's the, that's the uh, El Nino phase. And in the atmosphere, you get a counter current here. You get these strong winds this way. The rising air with convection occurs now on this side of the Pacific. So, you know, the whole chain reverses. So this is what we're heading to. In all likelihood, we're heading to a strong El Nino. In this case, the during the El Nino, <coughs> you get a lot of heat from the ocean coming up into the atmosphere. And that's why we set global temperature records in the atmosphere with the El Nino phase, okay? So those diagrams are the main ones to keep in mind and you can you can just google um go to google images and google enso enso um, and look at all the diagrams and you can see see these these diagrams there's quite a few of them and they're displayed in different ways so we've got the neutral case we've got the um the el nino phase coming up okay this, there's something called the multivariate enso index and this is a NOAA Earth Systems Research Labs, Physical Science Division, University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, you know, many of these scientists at Boulder, of course, lost their homes in the big fires in Colorado not too long ago. But anyway, if you look at the red, we're in El Nino's. And if you look at the blue, we're in La Nina's. And what you can see is that 1998 was a very strong El Nino. And from then on, climate deniers said, well, it's not getting warmer because 1998 was super warm, right? They were cherry picking data and completely wrong and misleading. Um, we had a very powerful, long lasting El Nino in 2015, 2016. In 2016, we set all global temperature records. And we've been in a cool state, cool, cooler state for the last three years. So uh, 2019, 2020, or 2020, 2021, 2022, um, you know, we've been in this, the, the La Nina state, the cooling state, and it looks like by summer, we'll, we'll start flipping over into an El Nino. So watch out global for temperature rise. If you look at the instrumental temperature record, uh, just on say Wikipedia, and enlarge this graph, which I've done here, this is some of the different groups, Berkeley Earth, Japan, NOAA in the US, Hadley Crutes in um, the UK, NASA, Goddard Institute of Space Sciences. They all have different temperature records and they're pretty much aligned. You can see 1998 was a record high temperature and the 2015, 2016 also set records. So what's gonna happen now? I'll refer to uh, James Hansen for that. But first, this is another view of um, the temperature records, but remember, so we've got the global temperature here. You know, we've reached about 1.2 degrees Celsius above the um, above the value in 1880 to 1900 or 1910, that temperature average. But remember, we don't live globally. We live on the land and the land surface temperature has risen way, way faster. The sea surface temperature has risen slower. The average gives you the global. So we're actually hitting it, hitting a lot more on land. We're seeing the effects on land. And again, this is an a Nino index uh, where we have the strong El Nino in 1998 and also in 2015, 2016. And we've had the cool period for three, third year in a row. Now, this is the James Hansen uh, sort of update, which just came out um, September 22nd. Uh, 2022. So this showed the monthly global temperature anomaly. You can see what happened in the 2016 year, which was the record high year. So, you know, look, we passed that 1.5 band. We, this was in January, February, March. It, don't, it was only in April that we dropped below the 1.5. And this was how the rest of the year played out. This is how 2021 was, and this is how 2022 was you know, up to when this was published, okay? The record high before 2022 is shown here. So this is, uh, so it was mostly in 2016, 
but there were other years that were higher in from April on, and that's the so this is the record high for each of the 12 months of the year. Okay, so Hansen said that uh, you know basically the past three months, so that would be July, June, July, August were remarkably warm. In, that's 2022 on global average, and this was remarkable because it's a La Nina year when the cool phase of the ENSO keeps a low latitude Pacific Ocean relatively cool. These three months, Northern Hemisphere summer, were each at or near records for the month, despite the La, the La Nina. Okay, so that was these numbers here. Um, they don't look like, you know, records. I mean, 2016, they're still way below 2016. But anyway, um, the current warmth that we're seeing that we saw in the summer of 2022, okay, which is here, very close, close to record. Okay, so the key is that these three months in the summer of 2022, they were close to the record high. And this happened in a La Nina year. Um, so why... Um, it's the uh, rapid gr growth of greenhouse gases um, causing the warming, a reduction of human-caused aerosols, so global dimming effect is reduced, and the rising phase of the solar irradiant cycle. Okay, so that's a 0.1% change, but we're heading into a warming cycle with the sun. So the, now, the La Nina is predicted to continue at least through the coming winter, so that includes, you know, for, say for the next three or four months, for a third consecutive year and uh but let's see what's going to happen next so el nino and la nina are the largest cause of global temperature variability on the time scale of a few years and it's hard to predict them more than a few months ahead but there is some inside information which allows us to make a guess so this is a the nino 3.4 so this is a zone in the pacific that's often used for an index on 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 enso and it's a temperature anomaly. So you can see, you know, what happened in 2015, 2016. Very, very strong um, El Nino. Um, and this is what's happened the last three years, 2020, 21, and 22. Uh, strong La Nina, strong cooling phase. So what's going to happen? Well, this is the temperature record, and this is the best, the best linear fit. Okay, the green line is... 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. Um, and you can see this is a running mean, the red line. Now you can see the strong El Nino in 98. Uh, they're labeled super El Ninos here, the strong one in 2015 and 2016. And here's where we are, we're in 2022. This is projected for 2023 and projected for 2024, blowing away the 1.5 degrees Celsius record, assuming that we get a decent sized El Nino. If we get another super El Nino, you know, you can look at the temperature rise. It's almost from here up to here. It's almost a full division. It's almost 0.2 degrees Celsius from here up to here again, 0.2. So if there's a super El Nino, we're already here, you know, taking a super one, it'll go well up over here. So this is what we're, what we're expecting. The next year, 2020, so this year, 2023, will be warmer because of the strong planetary energy imbalance, which is driven by the factors noted above, namely increasing greenhouse gases. Perhaps an El Nino will begin in the second half of the year, but the El Nino effect on global temperature, it lags by about three to four months. So the 2023 temperature should be higher than 2022, rivaling the warmest years. Okay, this would, should rival these two years. But then 2024, it's going to blow away temperature records because that lag will be realized. So 2024, and I agree with this analysis, it's likely to be off the chart as the warmest year on record. Without inside information, that would be a dangerous prediction, but we prefer it because it is unlikely that the current La Nina will continue for a fourth year. Even a little futz of an El Nino, so a weak El Nino, like the tropical warming in 2018, 2019. And you can see 2018, 2019. So if we get an El Nino as weak as this even, we're likely to blow past the, uh, that barely qualified as an El Nino, but that will be, should be sufficient for record global temperature. A classical strong El Nino in 2023, 24 would push global temperature to about plus 1.5 degrees Celsius, 
relative to the 1880 to 1920 mean. Okay, so we're heading into very, very uh, um, dangerously warm temperature um, over the next few years. Now, Hansen has they has petitioned the EPA to regulate the CO2 emissions. So the lawyer doing this is, is Dan Galpern. And with um, my group, um, Climate Emergency Forum, um, what we've had Dan and James Hansen on our show, um, and Dan multiple times to talk about these petitions to the EPA, which they keep rejecting, but we keep, you know, Dan is, and, 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 and uh, James Hansen keep trying and trying and trying. What else can you do? Um, <clears throat> thanks very much to all the people, more than a thousand who endorsed their petition to the EPA to regulate CO2 emission using the Toxic Substances Control Act, the TSCA. They made a second trip to Washington to encourage EPA to use its existing authority under that law, the Toxic Substances Control Act, which was strengthened by Congress in recent years with bipartisan support. CO2 fits the law's definition of a toxic substance to a T. Okay, so there was a presentation to the EPA. Lisa Van Susteren was a star. She put an hourglass on the table to emphasize that time was running out. She's a psychiatrist and psychologist, and she described the effect of young people on government's ineffectual action on climate change. Um, Greta Hansen, Gre Greta Thunberg, <laughs> Greta Hansen, Greta Thunberg um, was just detained by the German police as she was trying to stop a town being destroyed to make way for, for coal mining um, in Germany, of all places. Um, so anyway, Lisa, Lisa uh, she had nearly brought tears to the eyes of her co-petitioners. The EPA officials listened politely, got a few questions. And, you know, James of Hansen, of course, he, he gave a presentation to the EPA in 1982. And, um, you know, they got money back then to do computer modeling and stuff on what was happening. And then there, there was a lot of um, politics and they lost their funding and so on and so forth. So anyway, you can go, you can read this. I mean, and the Inflation uh, Reduction Act you know, should um, reduce emissions, but, you know, stuff is just not happening enough. I'm really looking forward to Hansen when his new book is coming out. Um, I think in April 15th is the release day, Sophie's Planet, Sophie's his granddaughter, and also the Greta Thunberg uh, book on climate. Um, I think it's coming out in February 15th or something. That's in Canada. I think it's out in Europe already. Anyway, the bottom line is that we're going to probably exceed all temperature records by far, global temperature records in 2024, that will greatly accelerate extreme weather that we see around the world. This is the official NOAA um, uh, probabilities for, you know, ENSO probabilities, and this was issued January 2023. So it's hot off the presses, it's just this month of the new year. Um, it's NOAA satellite and in, from NOAA, um, the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Services. So what you can see is this is the percent chance. This is the La Nina, the blue. Neutral is the gray and the El Nino is the red. So we're talking about March, April, May. You know, uh, you know, it started it maybe ticking up, small probability of the El Nino, and then higher and higher and higher as we go through 2023. So March, April, May, this is April, May, June. So they're offsetting here, you can see. This is um, May, June, July, June, July, August, July, August, September, August, September, October. So by the fall, we should be, you know, we, we're up to 50% chance of a, of a um, El Nino in 2023. The 